wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. Be sure to refer the show to your family, friends, relatives. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to uh, youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. See, I hit the bell notification button so you can do that as well. Go to all our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Just search the Chris Voss or Chris Voss Show. You'll find just we're we're just everywhere. Also go to our LinkedIn newsletter. We don't sign up for that thing. That thing goes out almost every day and has some of our hottest authors on it and all that good stuff. You know, you're gonna see the freshest book authors on there. Go to our 122,000 LinkedIn group on LinkedIn as well. Search for the Chris Foss show and all that good stuff. Anyway, guys, uh, we have a returning guest. She's been on before. It's it's uh, it's after coronavirus. It seems like it's been 50 million years, but she was on just last year. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. I, I'm not sure I'm still back from uh, COVID lockdown. But she is the author of the book, Exit Rich, The 6P Method to Sell Your Business for Huge Profit. Michelle Seiler Tucker is on the show with us today. And she's going to be talking to us about her book, Brilliant Mind. I, I learned a lot from her when she was on the show. And I think you're going to learn a lot from her. Once again, we'll get to talk to her about what's going on in today's world. Her and her team have sold 8,000 businesses to date. She currently owns and operates several successful businesses and holds the following professional designations and certifications. The Merger and Acquisition, acquisition Master Intermediary. Intermediary. <laughs> it's like Tuesday on a, on a Monday on a Tuesday. Certified Senior Business Analyst. Certified Mergers and Acquisitions Professional best-selling author and panelist for m and Source. Over the past decade, Michelle has sold several hundred businesses in franchise. What makes Michelle a formal force in her industry is that she closes nearly 98% of all offers she writes. On average, obtains a 20 to 40% and sometimes 60% higher selling price for her clients. Her remarkable track record proves her dedication and persistence, and here she is in the flesh today. Welcome to the show, Michelle. How Great, Chris. It's good to be back with you. It's good to be back, and I'm glad we all survived the, the whole uh, COVID thing, that crisis, whatever that was going on there. <laughs> Still surviving. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're there. So give me your plugs, your dot-coms, wherever you want people to check you out, uh, order up your books and stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So we launched Exit Rich last year, June of last year. And proud to say it's a Wall Street Journal bestseller, USA Today bestseller. You can get that at any of your favorite bookstores or Amazon. You can also go to exitrichbook.com. We're so excited that we're launching the, the audio version, Chris. Ah. You're asking me for the longest time, where's audio? Where's audio? Everybody says, I don't read. I don't read. <laughs> Everybody tell me they don't read, that they only listen to audio books. So we finally came out with the audio book. It came out May 1st. It's available for the month of May only for the promotion of $2.99. Wow. $2.99. That's less than a cup of coffee. That's less than a quarter pounder with cheese. That's less than a Happy Meal. I can't even, I could go on and on. $2.99. You also become a lifetime member into the Exit Rich Book Club where you will have access to video training when we're really discussing techniques and strategies for me being in the trenches for the last 20 plus years. And we have documents, Chris, documents to operate your business, such as employee handbooks, policy procedure manuals, not competes, documents to sell your company. Most business owners have never seen these documents. What does an evaluation look like? A prospectus, a uh, letter of intent, a purchase agreement, due diligence checklist, closing documents. All these documents together cost me over $50,000 to create over the last 20 years. They're there for your upload for $2.99. That's a good So deal. go order now. You can order on Amazon. You can order on Apple. You can order wherever you get your favorite audio book. And that is a heck of a deal, huh? It's it is. Country. And to get that deal where they get access to your group there, do, do they need to order that through Amazon? And then somehow they have a way to, to make that connection work? 
Well, so so what they need to do is order through, they can order through Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, and then just shoot us an email. And you can shoot us an email to marketing at SylarTucker.com with the receipt. And then we'll send you access to Solar, SylarTuckerAcademy.com. Our main website is SylarTucker.com. There you go. I, I feel less guilty now. I still have to do the audio book on my book that I put out in October. I'm just like, oh, so I, I tried to get it done when we were editing the book and it was, oh, between that and editing the book, I was like, uh, so I, I, I'm glad you got that out because I'm a big audio book fan. I read a lot of audio books. I, I go to the gym and then usually when I'm driving to the gym back and forth or driving anywhere, I've got audio books playing. So, uh, that's great that you have that available now. So let's talk about, so let's talk a little bit about you, maybe, uh, some background on you, what, what got you in the business and, and kind of your up and coming kind of an origin story, if you would please. Sure. So I've always been, you know, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship, even as a little girl, I would always tell my mom, I'm never getting a job. <laughs> I'm going to be my own boss that I don't like to be told what to do. Mm. And, and I used to tell my mom, stop telling me what to do. <laughs> but you know, so what do I do? I go into business, I open up many different businesses and who, guess who tells me what to do? My clients <laughs> and my business partners. So anyway, I've always been an entrepreneurship. I've owned many different businesses and different verticals. I actually got recruited from Xerox, you know, Fortune 500 company called Xerox and worked for them about six months as a high volume manager. And my nickname became the closer. So anytime somebody couldn't close a deal, they're like, call Michelle, she can close it. She closes everything. And then they asked, so then they asked me to interview for regional vice president position, which I did. And I actually got the position. And so I was in charge of the entire South region over seeing about over a hundred salespeople. And Chris, I realized how much I really didn't want a job. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, be careful what you wish for, because it was horrible. I mean, I'm okay. I was okay with the selling piece because I like selling. I like solving problems. I'm solution oriented. I love building relationships that last a lifetime. What I don't like doing is managing a bunch of, ba a, a bunch of kids. <laughs> they call themselves salespeople, but they're really toddlers. And so that's what I didn't like. So I ended up transitioning out of Xerox. And like I said, I've owned different businesses along the way, but I transitioned out of Xerox into my own franchise development, franchise consulting and franchise sales company. And in this company, I had um, equity in different franchisors. So I really specialized in area development, building out the franchise, taking somebody who has three locations to 50 locations. But I had so many buyers that kept asking me for, you know, existing businesses because franchising is not for everyone, right? Yeah. So. So I kept saying, no, no, no. And I'm like, oh gosh, I'm a big Bob Proctor fan. In fact, I've spoke with him on stage numerous times. And I'm like, I need to listen to the universe. <laughs> I need to go out there and start my M&A practice. And I did that a little over 20 years ago. Wow. And you guys have been doing it ever since. You've sold thousands of businesses, if I recall rightly, through your, through your company. You know, one thing I remember talking about with you that really stuck in my head was, you know, I, I built all my companies uh, to, to build an empire. And, and of course, you know, I, they, you know, ran into all sorts of different issues, like, you know, wipe, getting wiped out during the uh, recession and all that sort of good stuff. I mean, even the legendary Chris, Chris Voss runs into Paul. I hadn't read your book yet. I didn't learn from you that you're supposed <laughs> to build a business to sell it. And so let's talk about the title of your book, Exit Rich. What, why did you title it that? And, and what are the, uh, the six P method? Sure. So just to back up a little bit. So. You know, I started, like I said, I entered this industry a, a little over 20 years ago. And I realized pretty quickly, Chris, that most businesses are not sellable. And what Steve Forbes says is true. Steve Forbes endorsed Exit Rich. As Steve Forbes says, 80% of businesses on the market will never sell. M&A source says 90%. So that means you have less than a 10 to 20% chance of success when you put your business on the market. So I said to myself back then, I said, oh my gosh, if I don't fix these businesses, yeah. If I don't grow these businesses, I'm going to starve to death. So we really specialize in buying, selling, fixing, growing companies. I partner with business owners, investing my money, core competencies, resources, then to get their business back on track and so that we can sell a part of the desired sales price. So why did I name the book Exit Rich? Well, that publishing company came up with lots of names like Exit on Top, Exit on Your Terms, Exit This, Exit That. So like, well, what about just Exit Rich? And I'm like, oh, great idea. <laughs> So that's kind of how we came up with the name Exit Rich. 
Yeah, and I like the I like the idea that you had of when you design your business, when you build it, just from the very from the very beginning, you you start structuring it in an aspect of way that you could eventually sell it. Okay. And uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's one of the problems I have with the Chris Voss show. It's a little hard to sell because it's got my name on it. I've often thought, what if I could sell this thing? And then I don't know, you'd have to change it to something else. But I've actually thought about that. There's a, there's a new company that we've launched called the Chris Voss Leadership Institute surrounding my book. And I've bought both Chris Voss Leadership Institute.com and I think it's CVLI.com as well. So we have it so that if when I sell it, somebody can just take it to uh, C C V L I is the initials. So you've made me think about this stuff and use it for future business deals. <laughs> awesome. And it's very hard to sell a company that's tied to your brand. I mean, yeah. you Robbins, you know, Tony Robbins had to do an ESOP and sell to his employees years ago. And if you ever read the book, the millionaire mindset, T Harv Eckerd, he had to completely rebrand and get away from T Harv Eckerd and he started peak potentials. So. You know, you just have to look at your business and say, okay, how much of it is tied to you, you know, in the leadership program, how many coaches, consultants are you going to have, mm -hmm. how much is going to be tied to you? Because if it's tied to you, if it's still based upon you and your brand, it's going to be very, very difficult to sell. And then that brings me back to why 80% of businesses don't sell mm -hmm. for many reasons. First and foremost, business owners don't plan their exit. Like you said a minute ago, you know, Stephen Covey always said, start with the end in mind. Well. Michelle Saller Tupper says, you need to start your exit strategy from the minute you begin, you start or buy a business because business owners are so busy working in their business. They're not thinking about exit strategy until a catastrophic event occurs. And that catastrophic event can be health issues, partners disputes, divorce, death, you know, or this crazy pandemic that we've been living in for the last year and a half as an external example of a pandemic. I mean, yeah. Event. So you never want to sell your business, Chris, during a catastrophe. And what happens, Chris, is these business owners will call me and I always ask them, well, what's your desired sales price? And they'll say, oh, what do you want to sell your business for? You're laughing because you know the answer. So they always come to me and say, oh, I want to sell for $20 million. <laughs> but their EBITDA is 100000 you know, appreciation, <laughs> amortization. And they're like, how did you come up with $20 million with an EBITDA of 100 And I said, well, Michelle, you know, I need that to retire on. I need that to put five girls through college or pay for five weddings. I need that to buy another business. Well, buyers don't care about what you need or what you want. <laughs> buyers care about the value that your business brings to them and what they're willing to pay for that. You mean so, 50 times multiples isn't, isn't uh, revenue, isn't what, what you can sell for? Well, unless you have a SaaS business that's really taken off and it's a unicorn, and yeah. then maybe you'll get a 15 multiple revenues. <laughs> what if I can get Elon Musk to buy it? No, I'm just kidding. Maybe. I mean, he just bought Twitter. What's his reason why he bought Twitter, Chris? Why didn't he buy Twitter? I think he was high. I think he was high on the Joe Rogan show. <laughs> I think he was high on the Joe Rogan show. If you saw the smoking pot on the. <laughs> so anyway, so that's number one, why businesses don't sell is because they don't plan their exit. So in Exit Rich, we talk about plan your exit from the be beginning. And start with the GPS exit in mind, meaning come up with your destination, know your current value, know your time frame. There's five different types of buyers, know which buyers are right for your business. Then reverse engineer your plan, know your numbers, know the care, the characteristics uh, that these buyers are wanting to buy and will pay top dollar for. I mean, that's how you create a bidding war and that's how you maximize value. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, one of the biggest reasons too that businesses don't sell is kind of like what you said earlier. Yeah. This is you. So a lot of business owners have created themselves a glorified job that they go to work at every day versus a business that actually works for them. And if you are the business, it's not sellable. Now it's not just in a podcast or show my businesses. We're selling agriculture, agriculture business right now for $55 million. And guess what, Chris? They got $350 million, uh, 350 employees and the business is still dependent upon the owner. Wow. That's crazy, man. Employees. The owner has his hands in everything. The owner has all the client relationships. The owner knows everything about growing. I mean, it's just all in his head. And like I said, the client relationship. So, you know, in, in that case, the owner has to retain in, has to retain equity because otherwise the buyer's not going to buy it. And yeah. They need to, to 
you know, buy a smaller portion and keep the owner on in which to mitigate their risk. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're a smart person, you start grooming your uh, replacements and you start, you start looking, okay, who's going to replace me? Who's going to move up the food chain and everything else. Let's talk about you in the book. You talk about the six P method. Do you want to tease some of that out to us? Absolutely. So the first P is what we're talking about right now. And that's people. And I start with people because without people, you're not really getting anything done. <laughs> you're never going to build a scalable, sustainable business without people. And the only sure. thing you don't build a business, Chris, you build people or people build the business. Yeah. And most entrepreneurs are control freaks, right? Yeah. Not you, of course, not you. Well, I've been known. Most are control freaks. So they want to have their hand in every, uh, every pie, their finger in every pie. And then, you know, they like, well, if I want it done right, I have to do it myself. You'll never grow unless you let go of the control. So you have to make sure you have the right people in the right seats. And you have to ask the who question. Who handles customer service, quality control, you know, accounting, legal, manufacturing, distribution, et cetera. The list goes on and on. The clue here, Chris, is you should never be next to the who. Who? The business that runs without you. Look, I'll give you a perfect example. A dental practice called me and wanted to sell. Been in business 50 years. Great clientele. Guess what? One dentist, the owner, <laughs> three dental hygienists, one dentist or his daughters. Oh man. So I feel um, like I can sell your business, but I can't maximize value because God. you are, you and your daughters are the business. And I said, and the buyer is going to want you to retain equity and stay on for the, for two to three years. He said, well, honey, we're not, we're not staying. And I said, well, honey, you're not selling. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because a lot of the, in a business like that, a lot of the uh, customers are attached to the owner after he's been there for that long. And when he leaves, they're, they're you know, the book will, you know, probably lose some revenue and, and customers off the book because they'll be like, well, we kind of like Joe and Joe is gone now. So we don't like the new guy. So we'll go someplace else, right? Yep. And that's, that's service type businesses. Almost every service type business, mm -hmm. that's where they built themselves a glorified job than the actual business that works for them. But like I said, even in your larger companies, like the agriculture company, you know, business owners, like I said, want to maintain that control <laughs> Yeah, and they do that. Now we have an electrical company we're selling in the $50 million range. She's did just the opposite, Chris. He works 10 hours a week. He's got two facilities and he's got project manager at each location and the business can run without him. I like that model. I really like that model. 10 hours a week. Wow, isn't it? I might buy that business. <laughs> Yeah. $7, million, well, take, seven million dollars in eBay. Don't. Well, will you take a check? There you go. <laughs> so, so I think we covered what two of the P's? No, we covered one. No, we people. covered one. Like people. Yeah. Okay. People. Second P is is product. Okay. When you're in business, you have a product, the service, and industry. You're in the podcasting business, mm -hmm. right? So you got to look at your industry and say, is it on the way up? Is it on the way out? You know, like newspapers are on the way out, you know, print is on the way out. <laughs> Restaurants during this pandemic were on the way out. So you want to, you want to sell when you're in your prime. Mm. So you can ask yourself, are you an Amazon or are you a blockbuster? Mm. And you always want to sell when your business is doing well. And here's another big uh, caveat to that, Chris, is that the reason why so many businesses, especially restaurants, went out of business during this pandemic is because they have one profit center. Yeah. You have one way they get paid. Restaurants get paid if you go dine or if you take food out, but they don't have any commerce business. They don't have private labels. They're, you know, not doing cooking shows. They don't have any additional congruent revenue streams. You can't put all of your eggs in one basket. You always need to have those congruent revenue streams, additional opposites. Like me, I own many different businesses. So if one business doesn't like m and was terrible in 2020. <laughs> so guess what? I have medical legal marketing companies and multidisciplinary clinics. I have a graphics company. The specialized and first responders. So I always have different profit centers, but for restaurants and, and other business owners, don't diversify. Make sure it's congruent. <laughs> and but, so, now when you say with restaurants, congruency, do you mean like uh, a restaurant chain or, you know, I know well, a lot they can have multiple so. locations. Uh huh. But during the pandemic, that's not going to help you yeah, that's <laughs> because they can all close. But what if you had to eat? What if you have some specialty items? that you're the chef or your chef creates and they're really unique. I mean, start an e-commerce business. I have a restaurant chain that's actually private labeling some of their dressings and other sauces and things like that. And they're selling them into Whole Foods and other grocery stores. Mm -hmm. 
I got another restaurant that does wine and cheese, Zoom calls every week, and they pocket money from doing that because they charge you up from 150 to $300 for the wine and cheese. And I deliver it to your house. You can yeah, that the outside the box and say, how as a restaurant owner can I add convert streams about that? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I like too, when I interviewed last time, and I know we're interrupting the six Ps, the, the documents you were talking about, the, the people can have access to from you by ordering your order, your audio book. Those are really important to lay that foundation to where the business can be sellable. You know, instead of doing a sole proprietorship, you've got an LLC or something along those lines as a recommendation for you. And that's really important. Like people don't really think about that from the get go. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, they don't. They don't think about that. Just like they don't think about processes and employee handbooks and not compete for upper management and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, so that's, so product is, is that second P and let me tell you, if you don't have the right product, if you're not in the right industry, the right service, you're going to go out of business really quickly. You know, I always encourage clients to ask three questions. What business are you in? What business are you in? Mm. McDonald's. What business is McDonald's in? McDonald's is in a franchising business, isn't it? No. Uh, a, land business. They're yeah. a real estate business. Real estate business, yeah. So, and Amazon, like back in in the 80s, Amazon asked these questions. What business are we in? They said, we're in the book fulfillment business. We fulfill book orders. Yeah. Not true. What's your superpower? Amazon said our superpower is, our superpower is fulfillment. We do that better than everybody. Question number three, most important question, Chris, what business should, should you be at? The name of the game is pivoting. That's what yeah. seven piece pivot, <laughs> but you got to pivot. You got to adjust. You got, you know, you got to be flexible. You're either growing or dying. There's no in between. So Amazon asked those three questions. Those three questions literally transformed Amazon to from a small book fulfillment center to a multi, multi, multi billion dollar corporation what how do you feel about franchising i was uh, typing out a note here franchising uh how do you feel about that do you think people should start their own companies or franchise if they're looking to exit rich so that's my background mm -hmm. franchising i did that before i got into m a so i always say franchising there's different aspects of franchising buying a franchise if you've never owned a business before and you're not really an entrepreneur and you're just leaving corporate america because you have this dream of being your own boss. Mm -hmm. I think franchising is a good partner because you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. Yeah. You training, you have the procedures, you have the policies, processes, you, you know, they usually assign a mentor, you know, to make sure that you're up to speed on everything and good franchises will research good locations or do due diligence. You know, they'll help you with due diligence. I'll help you make sure you're getting in the right demographics area. Etc. So that works great for corporate people that want to leave corporate America. Not so great for entrepreneurs yeah. <laughs> because entrepreneurs want to make their own decisions like me, you know, they, they want to have control. They want to be able to grow things. They don't want to be told what to do all the time. So franchise is not right for them, which is why I had so many buyers asking me for existing businesses when I was specializing in selling franchises. Now, if you have a really good concept. And you want to franchise that it's the best way to leverage other people's money and grow on your footprint exponentially. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend successful. You have, you should have three, four, five locations first before you decide to go franchise that out. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to sell franchises than a normal business? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because here's another good solid point. If you're looking to buy a franchise and franchisors hate me when I say this, but I tell the truth, if you're looking to buy a franchise, don't buy a new franchise, don't buy a new franchise because oh. they're going to tell you it's going to cost you 250 to 400 maybe for Baskin Robbins mm -hmm. or 300 to 500, but guess what? They're always low in their estimates. Build out always, if you've ever built anything commercial wise, build out always costs more than they tell you it's going to cost. Yeah. It always takes twice as long as what they tell you it's going to take. Then you got to order, you know, new equipment, inventory. You, you got to build out that space, furniture, pictures, and equipment. You got to, you know, hire people, et cetera. And you're spending money based upon what it costs to build that new franchise. An existing franchise, you're paying based upon what the three or four month trailing average is. 
So you're basing that on the actual numbers. Years and years ago, my firm sold a basket of ramen. I've been in business for 30 years for $190,000. Even if this is for 30 years, I had a dynamite location, had employees in place, had employee tenure, had a great client base, fabulous location. And guess what? They're making $90,000 a year, sometimes more. And we sold that for 190 because it was based upon the cash flow. A brand new one would cost you four to 500,000 with no cash flow. Wow. Why would you ever go buy a new franchise? Always buy an existing franchise. And then franchises are not good in my opinion mm -hmm. for attorneys and doctors and things like that, because they buy like a smoothie, they'll buy like a smoothie king or an ice cream franchise or something like that. And what happens when employees don't show up? Yeah, they you, have to show up. Stuck, yeah. and they're a lawyer. They're a doctor. <laughs> you know, I have one lawyer say, Michelle, I invested over $600,000 in this front of franchise. The people are stealing from me. They're not showing up. They're not doing this or that. Wow. I find myself now running this business to stay in my law practice, which I make $350 an hour in my law practice. So if you're, if you're looking to make an investment as a, a professional, you know, you want to make sure you buy an existing franchise or buy something that doesn't need so many people to operate it. How has COVID changed or what's going on right now? You know, you, you, you bring up a good point with that story. I, I've sometimes gone into some, because everybody here in Utah, there's a signs up going, we, we need employees, please come. And I've been wondering, sometimes I go into business, I'm like, am I going to find the owner behind the counter? You know, just trying to keep the thing going. In fact, I know of one IHOP here in Utah where the owner is working the she's she's running the whole thing and her daughter is one of the waitresses because they can't get enough people it's crazy yeah. and I, hope. I know and you know what it just boggles my mind because you want to work for two years <laughs> where's the money coming from i think government shut off all the pay yeah, they did. where's the government where's the money coming from yeah. how are they making money how are they sustaining their their lifestyle so it just boggles my mind it's very difficult in all industries right now that the, the company I told you were selling for 55 million, man, they had, they had like three people walk out and the M&A firm uh -huh. that we're working with, law firm that we've been working with for 20 uh, years, they had three attorneys just walk out one day. Jeez. So it's pretty much tough in every single industry. You just gotta get really creative. Think outside the box. Don't, don't, you gotta change your hiring methods completely. Change your interviewing style, change your hiring methods, you know, and just really start to do things differently. Is there any, is there any maybe preferred businesses you should look at? Maybe ones that maybe aren't maybe as employee intensive that have, you know, I don't know what manufacturing or something. I don't know that something that doesn't have employee into automation sort of things. Yeah, there are, but you got like SAS company, commerce right. companies, things of that nature, but you gotta be very careful with that because what's, what happened in these last two years is a lot of millennials and Generation X, you know, they're, they're, they're solution oriented. So they have started SaaS businesses, they've started e-commerce businesses and everything else. I mean, I got a guy who started a coffee business, manufacturing coffee pots, selling like crazy on Amazon, you know, 90% of his business was really Amazon, but he was, he was restructuring that and he was getting his stuff because he also did coffee too. He was private labeling and getting things, you know, in the hands of you know, medical providers and things like that. But then he was going to the grocery store. So he was really diversifying, but the problem is he had no infrastructure. He had no employees. He had one employee, the rest were 1099s. We got another guy that has an app company. It's him and his wife, their, their EBITDA is about $2 million a year, but it's just them two. We got another online education business where it's him and his wife, you know, so you have to be careful on the flip side of that. Because when you go to sell that, if you don't have the infrastructure, buyers are typically going to walk away. Unless it's a business that has the infrastructure themselves mm -hmm. and can fold it, you know, into their company and, and utilize their resources. Otherwise, most buyers will walk away. We've had so many buyers walk away from these different companies because they don't have the infrastructure. Wow. It's very careful. It's, you know, you really got to find that happy mix <laughs> between technology. And if you're a voice, it's automation is the name of the game. You know, Definitely. You figure out a way that you can automate everything to reduce, you know, the employee cost. Another thing is, is jobs are being lost in America too, because employers have had it. 
So they're starting to go outside of America and, and do business with the Philippines and do business mm-hmm. in India and different countries like that because you can get them for a fraction of the cost. They usually don't complain. They usually don't call them sick. <laughs> they don't bring up problems to them. <laughs> and so America's going to lose jobs because of that too. And then you're going to lose even more jobs because companies like McDonald's and Burger King and banks and they're all automating. Mm-hmm. You no, know, you won't even have somebody taking your order anymore. If you go through an airport, look at all of the restaurants that are now automated. Even bartenders, when you go to a bar, there's auto, there's a computer taking your order <laughs> and cracking jokes. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Are you going to yeah. the McDonald's Taco Bell now? There's like a thing there and you're just like, it's, it's hard to get used to for me because I'm just, you know, used to people person, but I, you know, I think people, the younger generation like it more. It well, looks like. Technology driven, right? That, mm-hmm. like, that we are. We're like, oh my God, we got to learn new technology. I remember when the airport kiosk came out, I'm like, where is that fire side? <laughs> like, how do I get extra pickles on my burger? Like, <laughs> which one of these buttons does that? It, it appears that I, I'm interested in your input on this as well, but it appears to, that we are ending a recession. But we're in the, we've already passed the first quarter and all we need is a second quarter and we are officially in a recession. Clearly, the Fed's going to make five or six moves. They're way behind the eight ball and making their moves. Do you see a coming recession? And what's the best way to either recession proof your business or recession proof me companies that you're looking, maybe stuff that you're looking to buy that would be recession proof? Yeah. So, like, you know, look, Tony Robbins says this all the time. Tony Robbins always says, winter is coming, winter is coming, winter is coming, prepare now. And so, <laughs> um, you know, what goes up, let's come down, right? Well, it goes up, let's come down. So, of course, we're going to be in, head into a recession. You've, you've already seen the writing on the wall. Yeah. Uh, the Feds are going to increase interest. It's going to be harder to get money. Private equity and, and strategics and stuff have been telling us, you know, with our sellers, are like, look, you want to sell this business? You better hurry up before July because once June or July comes, well, the money is going to dry up. You're not going to see as many transactions as you do right now in M&A because M&A had a record year for 2021 and it started 2022. That's predicted to dry up by July or August. And then same thing. And then the housing market's going to, oh my gosh, you're going to see more big boxes in the Yeah, you're going to see collapse. But guess what? If you plan right, Mm -hmm. you're strategic, you can take advantage. I mean, there were more, more, more millionaires created out of the Great Depression than ever before. Out of this pandemic, there were billionaires created. And guess what? Out of this new recession, you're going to see more billionaires created. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. That's the key. (laughs) So what else do we want to touch on in your book? I think we got a few. That's why we won't buy another house right now because I'm not going to pay double or duple price because uh, because it's about to come down, you know? I mean, Toronto's already dropped, I think, 20, 22%. Lumber prices are on the way down. Uh, you know, I lived through, I own a mortgage company for 20 years, and I've lived through all the recessions since 2008. I see what's going on. I'm like, yeah, you don't want to be buying right now because it's going to pop. It's going to pop. Now, if you're in the stock market, buy. That's when you buy. That's when you buy, mm-hmm. buy, buy. You don't pull your money out of the stock market. <laughs> you buy, 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 right? Yeah. So what else do we want to cover on your book or tease out so that people order that baby up? We can go through the rest of three. Uh, six, we got four P's left. We can go through those really quickly. Um, the third one is processes. It's the number one reason why businesses fail. Lack of working capital and lack of processes are the reasons why businesses fail. So you got to button up your processes. You got, you got to figure out what your clients want to experience because consumer buying habits have changed dramatically. Whoever yeah. makes it easiest for the consumer to purchase, like Amazon, they're winning. Yeah. You know, so you got to go back to your clients and ask them. What are the three things you want to experience? Everyone should do that with their clients right now because whoever creates a wow experience is the one that's going to win their business. Otherwise, you're going to lose market share. You got to have processes, SOP checklists, employee handbooks, not competes, et cetera. And design your processes around the customer experience. Wow. What an idea. Most consumers design their processes around their own agenda. Look at doctor's offices. They're open Monday. Monday through Thursday, nine to five, and they're usually closed on Fridays. My husband and I own medical clinics. That's what mm-hmm. we did. We said, what are our, our patients want? They want flexible hours. Guess what? We're open three nights, uh, three nights a week till 7.30 at night. Holy crap. And we'll open Saturday a half a day. Wow. Two, till two, actually. That got unheard of. Exactly. So what did McDonald's do in 1940? 
When I said we want to develop a fast food restaurant, they said we want to design it around the customer experience. Well, uh, customer experience, great taste of food is hot, fast, 30 seconds or less. It's why you can eat at McDonald's anywhere in the world and get the same experience, right? Wow. So 4P really quickly is the highest value driver. Let me give you a crash course of evaluation. Businesses that have less than a million dollars in EBITDA or ECB branches tax depreciation amortization will trade anywhere from one and a half to three, maybe three and a half. Yeah. If you're a SaaS company, you're always going to trade. Well, I say always, but you're going to trade at a multiple of revenues, not EBITDA. Yeah. Business is over a million. So that's your sweet spot. The goal is to get your business over a million dollars in EBITDA because that's where all the buyers are, Chris. Oh. That's where all the buyers are. There's five different types of buyers. So get your EBITDA over a million dollars and then your, your multiples start at four and a half, five. Proprietary assets, proprietary is the next P. It's the highest value driver of any of the other P's. Proprietary is branding. The more well branded you are, the more we can sell your company for as long as your brand is relevant in the mind of consumers. Nobody's buying Blockbuster <laughs> or Toys R Us, but Apple is a lot, the most valuable brand in the world. Their brand is worth 289 billion. Their entire company is mm -hmm. just brand alone is 289. You, you want trademarks, make sure you trademark. Don't just get a state trademark. You need to get a federal trademark. Otherwise you can receive a system to assist letter in the mail. You have to stop using that company name. So get a federal trademark on your company name on your podcast show. Did you know, Chris, that the attorneys told me that I still have to federally trademark Siler Topo, even though it's my company name. Really? Yes. Because wow. I, because I was flabbergasted. And this, this is a trademark attorney that's really big, big, big time. And that's all they do. And I said, yes, Michelle, because if somebody opens up Siler M&A firm, our Tucker M&A firm, there's nothing you can do. Wow. Wow. So, you want to trademark your name so nobody can open up Tupper m and Farm or Siler, you know, m and Farm. That's what so makes you don't want to think about that, trademarking your name. Lost podcast. <laughs> Does anybody really want to copy a guy who looks like this? <laughs> You're not copying how you look. They're copying about how successful. That's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. so anyway, trademarks. Trademark your products. We have a company that has exclusive products to all of our TJ Maxx, you know, and, and each product, they're the same products, Chris, uh -huh. they have different names. <laughs> they all have a bunch of trademark. You want to have patents, right? Patents bring value. We sold a company for $18 million that had 18 patents and wasn't making that much money. Then guess what? Contracts, vendor contracts, manufacturing, franchise wars, by the way, we never finished that question. Franchise or businesses sell like hotcakes. We get a franchise or that has a hundred. 200, 500 franchisees, they sell like this because everyone wants to buy a business that has multiple profit centers, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but you have to have contracts and guess what? Client contracts, subscription model is where it's at, baby. Subscription model, you need that many, as many people you good can is good, yeah. on a reoccurring revenue stream. But guess what? Chris, all business owners make this huge mistake. They don't have the transferability clause in their contract. So 98% of all sales are asset, not stock. So if your buyer doesn't agree to a stock sale, then you have to go to your clients and ask them to sign a consent to transfer. We have a media company that's got 2,000 clients. Holy crap. Plus, if you go to your clients, now they know you're selling your business and your deal might fall apart. That's true. They're like, we, we like the old man. Yeah. Yeah. Celebrity endorsements are huge. We got a client working with Oprah. <laughs> Competitors will pay, strategists will pay a lot of money for that because they want their products in front of the queen of everything, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with radio personalities. Same thing with you, Chris. You could probably be an influencer and endorse stuff. So all of that drives value. Number five P is patrons. That's your client base. Most businesses follow the 80-20 rule where 80% of their revenues comes from 20% of their clients. You lose one client, two clients, you're in big trouble. Yeah. This $55 million company we're selling has 70% customer concentration. In one retail chain. Holy crap. If they lose, so what's that, they lose that? 70 percent of the revenue. Yeah. I know. That's not so, good. The last few is profits. That's why we're all in business is to make money. We are. I can say, Chris, I am. Well, I, well, I'm in business to help people. I mean, I can retire if I want to do that. <laughs> business it's to help people. You speak of. But anyway, yeah, lack of profits is never the problem. It's the symptom of not having the right people in place, being in a dying industry. You know, not having your processes buttoned up, not protecting your proprietary, your IP and having to spend more money. 
Also, your IP should always be held in a separate corporation. Mm-hmm. What happens if you get sued? Yeah. <laughs> and everything's in the same corporation. So yeah. that's the six Ps. Yeah. I've, 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 I, you know, we used to always do C, uh, C corps on all of our businesses and people be like, why do you do that? Doing it, doing it, doing it, and all this stuff. And I'd be like, I'd be like, I don't know. It seems like a good idea. We just did it for protection. But man, once we start, got really successful and then the lawsuits come when you're, you know, when you're rich and successful. Oh, that's about awesome. you when you're small. Yeah. No one sues you when you're small, but yeah, man, we, we learned, we learned what rich people warfare is. It's, it's courts and suits and. You know, and we were suing people too. We, we had a lot of salespeople and, you know, they would steal like, you know, thousands of dollars of leads. And so, you know, it, it was, we always had stuff going on, some sort of shenanigans and, yeah. and the people who leased our buildings, you know, we had issues with them. So yeah, the, the C Corp was really nice. It was really nice to sleep well at night when you're being sued over something. You know, we hired employees once, I think that had, what you would call it, contracts where they couldn't work for somebody else. You know, all sorts of fun that you get. Anything more you want to touch on or tease out before we go? I would touch, i touch on, you know, one of the biggest things I always say, because a lot of times the bigger you get, the more problems you have, right? Like you just mentioned. And so it's not what you know that gets you in trouble. It's what you don't know. And what got you here won't get you there. So if you got a, a, a million dollar business and you're trying to go to a 10 million business, to yeah. 10 million business. You're going to need a different coach. You're going to need a different mentor. You're going to need a different team. Yeah. You're going to probably need a different CEO. You see big corporations change out their CEOs all the time. So the one thing that I always say is, is get a mentor that's been down the path you want to travel because that will shorten your learning curve dramatically. Learn from other people's mistakes. Don't learn from your own. And I always say it's hard to read the label from the inside of a bottle. You need an outsider's perspective to read the warning signs to keep you out of the danger zone. <laughs> I do that with vodka. I think I read from the inside of the label, the box. Uh, it's tequila for me. Is it? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Don Julio. But at any rate, I encourage everybody to go get your call, your audio book today, like now, as Amazon, Apple's, Barnes & Noble for $2.99. Send us the email to marketing at Solar Tucker. We'll make sure you get access to Solar Tucker Academy. Take the 6P, 6P quiz at Solar Tucker Academy. You can contact us at SolarTucker.com and follow me on social media. It's Michelle Solar Tucker. And most importantly, listen to our podcast, Exit Rich, where we interview million dollar and billion dollar exits. We just had Peter Thompson, the founder of Snap Fitness, who sold twice, Chris. He sold the first Snap Fitness for 40 million, retaining equity. The second time he sold for 30 million. 70 million on one business is not bad. That is not bad at all. And we were chatting. I actually bought the book, the audio book. Let me see if I can pull it up here. It looks like it's uh, giving me the whole thing there. So we got to get your book on the audible now. So awesome! everyone order it up and all that good stuff, because this is really brilliant. I mean, like I said, I, I, I built my business totally wrong after finding out what, you know, sorry. <laughs> but you know what? A lot of people have, it's not just you, you're not yeah. unique. <laughs> yeah. But you have me thinking, like I said, the new Chris Voss leadership Institute is designed with not only dot coms, but so it can break down the name and be sellable. It's going to have consultants, of course, that will work for it for, you know, leadership institute, consulting, all that sort of think tank crap. And that sounds great, huh? Think tank crap. And so it's designed to be sellable. And it's because I, you know, had you on the show last year and, and, you know, fun is fun, man. So people should definitely learn this. It's really important. Yeah. A, a thousand percent. So go out and get your audio book, $2 and 99 cents. Do not buy your cup of coffee today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Look like four times the amount of two ninety nine, right? <laughs> coffee. And um, if you like to read, go get the print version, and you can get that as well with Amazon. There you go, Michelle. Do we get all your final dot coms and every place we want people to go check you out on the interwebs? I think so, but I can say it again: if you want to buy um, the printed book, you can go go to exitrichbook dot com. Tucker dot com is our main website. SolarTuckerAcademy dot com is where you can take the six P quiz to see how you score. Mm. What's your, what's your strongest piece? What's your weakest piece? There you go. It was wonderful to have you on once again, Michelle. I certainly appreciate you coming on board and uh, saying hello to us again. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. I Thank you. It's always fun. Thank you. And thanks for my honest for tuning in. Go to youtube.com for just Chris Voss. Be sure to refer this show to your family, friends, and relatives. Put your arm around them and say, you know, if you listen to the Chris Voss show, it's the family that loves you but doesn't judge you. The best kind of family there is. Go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. Go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Make sure you sign up for the LinkedIn uh, newsletter 
This will be on there, I think, in the next couple of days. And uh, also go to our big LinkedIn group. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time. Stay safe. Bye-bye.